This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Allen, Chris Smith, Mark Gibson, and another Chris, our new patron, Chris. Welcome. On this episode of DTNS, Meta doesn't seem to be able to lose its user base. Tesla has some explaining to do. That's an understatement. And Patrick Norton is here to explain why the Calix Institute might be right up your alley. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 27th, 2023. From Studio Secret Bunker that needs a new name, I'm Sarah Lane. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. At the edge of St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Well, we are going to get into uh, meta earnings, Tesla, mm, I don't know, fudging some numbers, um, and a few other things, too. Um, we've got Patrick Norton here, so you know it's going to be a good show. But let's start with the quick hits. <music> The European Union opened a formal antitrust investigation into whether Microsoft abused its dominant position by bundling Teams with Office 360. Now, you might recall that back in 2020, Teams competitor Slack filed a complaint against Microsoft stating that bundling in Teams gave it an unfair advantage over competitors, which violates EU laws, so there might be more to the story. After a 95% drop in second quarter operating profits, Samsung, the world's largest chip maker, announced it will cut back chip production, citing weak demand for consumer devices. On a brighter note, the company will focus on higher end chips to meet the demand to gener for generative AI. Samsung also expects global demand for memory chips to rebound gradually in the second half of this year. U.S. Senators Elizabeth Warren and Lindsey Graham sponsored a bipartisan bill to establish a new federal agency tasked with regulating online platforms. The new bill would create the Digital Consumer Protection Commission that would be empowered to go after giant tech firms, you know the ones, for a slew of anti-competitive behaviors and failure to protect consumer privacy. Sony announced that it has sold 40 million PlayStation 5 since the console's launch in 2020, and that includes 8 million units this year despite pandemic-related supply chain issues. Sony Interactive Entertainment CEO Jim Ryan assured fans that the PS5 is currently well-stocked. Adobe announced a new feature in Photoshop's new beta called Generative Expand, which uses AI to expand images beyond their original bounds. You might say, what? So you sort of use the crop tool in reverse. You select an image, you can expand the canvas, and then allow Adobe's Firefly family of generative AI models to fill out that additional white space that wasn't part of the original photo. So for example, maybe somebody got cut out of the group selfie that you took on vacation. Photoshop will generate the rest of the body and the face of the person that you cut off and hopefully they do a good job and you'll still be friends with them afterwards. And those are the quick hits. All right, let's talk a little bit about Meta's earnings. Now, Meta has had an interesting few years for a variety of reasons. They released, and I might say they crushed, uh, Q2 earnings results, um, you know, for the month, uh, for, for the quarter ending in June. Revenue was up 11% year over year to $32 billion. Net income was up 16% year over year to $7.79 billion. Facebook monthly active users up 7% year over year to $3.07 billion in June. Now you might say, huh, what? Yes, Meta said that Facebook passed 3 billion monthly active users for the first time for the month of June. As for its family of apps, which is not only Facebook, but also Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, going forward, Threads would be part of this as well. Those uh, overall grew 6% year over year as well to $3.88 billion, covering nearly half of the world's population. Well, some of this is recovery and advertising. Apple's app tracking transparency, or ATT, screwed up Meta's digital ad sales big time, with revenue declining for the first time ever last year, but things seem to be rebounding. 
Meta still has a long goal with its Reality Labs division, which now has lost more than $21 billion since the beginning of 2022. Meta said in its report that it expects operating losses in the Reality Labs unit to increase meaningfully year over year due to our ongoing product development efforts in augmented and virtual reality and investments to further scale our ecosystem. Patrick, Meta is making money in the present, but is losing it in the future. What do you think about this? What are your thoughts? Uh, this is a terrifying sci-fi moment you know uh we're making money now it's do you remember the the days of the dot-com era where you know we lose money on every bag of dog food we ship but we're gonna make it up in volume it's like we're gonna make more money now and yeah. lose it in the future I, which is not really what I mean, they're the saying lost leader thing is i mean it's not yeah. You know, you know, Meta is not the only company to be to be to be doing this and and hoping that long term it comes back. But yeah, right. it's it's there, there's a lot going on here. I, it's funny, right? Because it's true, right? They're they are operating losses. You know, they are pumping a staggering amount of money into the Re Reality Labs division. And part of me is like, okay, is this like? You know, Zuckerberg's in an interesting position. He basically controls the voting, and unlike most companies, pretty much controls. You know, he, he controls his company, unlike most publicly held companies, because of the way the voting rights are structured. So he can do something. A lot of companies now, they don't do a lot of long-term research. So what if we think of the Reality Labs division as being this great, grand, deep, long-term research division? You know, his version of Xerox Park. He's going to pry us all off of screens, slap goggles on our faces, and make sure we never do anything outside of Facebook in the future. Um, you know, we, I, I'm, I'm looking over because somewhere in this wall of books over there is, is Ready Player One. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I'm I, that whole expects operating losses to increase meaningfully year over year. <laughs> like, did, did, they, did they put an end yeah. on that? <laughs> I know it's like how meaningful exactly, uh, yeah. you know, Meta uh, and Reality Labs. I mean, listen, I I know I'm I'm the person in the group who's always crowing about how I think VR is really cool and people just don't get it yet, and you just have to have that cool app that you love, and then you get it. Even if you only have a few apps, you don't really need like that many. It's not unlike a mobile phone. You're probably going to use the same five apps over and over, uh, but um, it, uh, the, the quest experience is the only VR experience that I've ever had. Obviously that's the meta quest. Yeah, the I was gonna say, and they own it. So you, you're obviously bullish on meta's future. I mean, cause I, one of the things I, I, used want to talk about I want to be, because I don't want it to go away. I mean, it's more right. that I'm slightly worried that it's going to go away and <laughs> I'm going to be like, Oh, totally that was a here. fun thing that I did for a couple of years. I want it to be a cooler part of life. I know right. we've, you know, the whole <laughs> AR conversation is a whole other thing. And Meta is, is only one player in, in that whole business. And I, I still don't really understand what the metaverse is otherwise. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I wonder how much the losses um, are going to be, I mean, listen, Meta has bought itself some time here with sure. this latest earnings report. Mm -hmm. You know, people go, cool, all right, let's buy some stock. Um, but uh, <laughs> but that's not going to last forever if, you know, if the company still bleeds money from, from well, it's, you know, reality labs. It's also kind of crazy, right? Because the, the, the first part of this was 3 billion global users. I, I like, there's just a little popping noise above my head just contemplating that. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's just even if you make, you know, just a tiny bit of money off each user, that's going to pile up in a huge way and offset the losses. I don't know. I'm actually really curious to see, right? Because the the kind of the early looks in the metaverse, like almost every AR and VR experience we have, there's like the advertisement, and it's going to do this amazing things. Then people finally get it, and it's it's an order of magnitude worse than you know what you thought it would be based on the initial hype, uh, you know. Can we create this giant online place? I mean, are we replacing Discord? Are we replacing, you know, are we all just going to sit around and watch virtual shows? Are we going to interact? Is it going to be dancing? Is it going to be a, will there be a neural cutout like a William Gibson novel? And we're going to actually physically feel present in there. Nobody knows. Um, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just want to say the fact that they said that they're, they've lost 21 billion on this What's unit and it's going number? to ramp up from that. Mark Zuckerberg is spending money in this area. So yeah. it sounds like he's going to do everything he humanly possibly can to make sure that your MetaQuest mm -hmm. 
will still be viable in a couple of years from now. <laughs> yeah. um, so we have to see because they're spending, yeah. uh, we, we're talking about billions, like it's millions. It's like, no, these are <laughs> billions of dollars that they're spending on this. You know, the um, old joke, a billion well, here, a billion there. Pretty soon we're talking about real money. <laughs> <laughs> I know. What's a billion? Not cool anymore. But uh, yeah, I, when I saw the, my first reaction was like, who is still going to Facebook? And that is, that that's a naive way to think about this just because well, I don't. And a lot of people that I used to hang out on Facebook with a lot more back in the day also don't seem to be very present. There does not mean that other people are not present on Facebook. Clearly these numbers reflect right. that. So, you know, that that's something to take into consideration. It's like, okay, uh, you know, Roger, before the show, would mention the Facebook marketplace and that that's really helpful. Like, what does drive people there um, globally, I'm, not just locally, but globally? And, you know, what is driving people there? And because it, it whatever it is, it's working. Well, it's, it's funny, right? Because one of the challenges, you know, we're in a group for a school that my youngest son goes to. They don't have any presence outside of Facebook. Uh, my wife, who had, you know, burned Facebook to the ground and walked away from it, ended up reinstating her account so she could deal with some of the communications coming from this group. Um, there are a ton of places. I'm always shocked when I run into places where their website redirects, the, their website URL redirects their Facebook page, or we only do Facebook, or the group is on Facebook, or the schedules. And there's so many places that are locked in. But it's also kind of crazy. Uh, I'm looking at this breakdown. I think it's Overload.com, they're claiming they have the statistics for the current uh, global distribution. 370 million users in India, 186 million users in the United States, 135 million users in Indonesia, 114 million users in Brazil, uh, you know, 93 million in Mexico, 91 million in the Philippines. There's just a lot of people. Um, 3 billion is just a staggeringly large number, too. Um, so I'm kind of... <laughs> I know. You know, it's apparently I don't know what they're doing, but boy, they're they're doing a lot of it or a lot of people are doing it on Facebook. Um, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, all very true. And yeah, a, a good a good anecdote from you, Patrick, about, you know, people who are like, well, I don't really like it, but everyone else is I have to talk to other people from my kids school for example um, mm -hmm. there are quite a few of those uh, situations that I've heard about as well real quick uh, just you know because we're talking about the meta family of apps whatsapp has also added short messaging not unlike the voice messaging feature that the service already supports they announced that our earlier this year I think about six months ago whatsapp video messages can now be up to 60 seconds long. And uh, miraculously, will autoplay on mute in chat. Now, voice messages don't autoplay. Uh, they can also be as long as you want. So it's a whole different thing. But WhatsApp, getting into video messages. So this next one is like, it, it, it kind of got me. But Reuters is reporting that for about a decade, Tesla has been purposely exaggerating range estimates on its lineup of EVs at full charge and was done so at the direction of chief executive Elon Musk. The report also claims that Tesla last summer created a Nevada-based diversion team focused solely on canceling service appointments from customers concerned they were experiencing range-related battery issues. Oh, boy. All right. So uh, according to Reuters reporting, an anonymous source said that Tesla – used algorithms that would inflate projections at full charge. Then once the batteries actually got down to 50%, the numbers became a bit more realistic. So drivers really weren't going to get stranded or had a better chance of not getting stranded, you know, if, if they needed hmm. to recharge. Along with a 15-mile buffer allowing the vehicle to drive on battery even after it reaches zero. Now, I've pushed this with gas cars enough to know that Tesla, you're not the only one here. But according to this source, quote, Elon wanted to show good range numbers when fully charged. I know that anybody who runs a company like Tesla would want to show good numbers when fully charged, but it is a very different story 
if you, you know, if you're, uh, you know, listening to Reuters sources, Reuters is, you know, has a good track record with this stuff, track record with this stuff saying, uh, yeah, the company was doing all sorts of things to make you think that your range was way better uh, when you set off on your journey. Yeah, I just, this one, it it really, it, it really, it, I don't want to say it shocked me, but I was like, wow, this is, this is what they're doing because they, you know, they're saying that, you know, Reuters was reporting that they were inflating these numbers to the point that customers calling in was such a problem for them that they created a whole team whose sole purpose was to, no, you're, you're good. You really don't need to get your car fixed. And the only reason that people were thinking they needed to get their car fixed was because the numbers that Tesla was reporting were inaccurate numbers on purpose. So it's like, you know, you created this problem, but then you created a team to rectify the problem. You know, people's cars really didn't have an issue. They were doing what they were designed to do. They just weren't doing what you were told they were going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, that is, that is a, that's a big deal when you think about what Tesla was doing. They're not the only company that does it. It's just the fact that they've now been caught. This is a big deal. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like at some point there's going to be the argument that, you know, well, if you go into insert automotive makers vehicle here, they claim this is your gas mileage or this is your real world gas mileage or this is your range. And if you drive it in the real world, it never matches that, you know, or that there our algorithm is designed to maximize the theoretical range based on optimal conditions to, you know, what I mean, for whatever reason, I, I don't know if there's. I don't think I don't see Congress getting together to 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 launch the all automotive manufacturers must make more realistic expectations of the instrumentation in their vehicles, you know, with some crazy acronym that knits that all together. But I was laughing because I was trying to remember the whole diesel gate, um, Volkswagen diesel gate thing, right? It was like a half a billion or excuse me, half a billion, five hundred was it five hundred thousand cars, they got fined a billion dollars. And there's this funny car and driver uh article that's basically um you know general motors and toyota have had their massive scandals now it's volkswagen's turn and it's like what in the 21st century we have to have a massive scandal for every automotive manufacturer will this be elon's but i i i I mean it just like call me crazy here but okay let's say i'm a tesla owner i am not but many people in our audience are uh many contributors to our show are Uh, and if I go, well, hold on, this doesn't seem right. No, I'm, I'm not getting the range that I'm supposed to get. Let me, let me take it in. And there is a team (laughs) that has been erected to say, nope, you're fine. Um, that is such a waste of talent and resources, isn't it? They were saving a thousand dollars per canceled appointment. And this pun is intended. Were these folks gaslighting Tesla owners? <laughs> Unintended. I mean, in a in a weird way, yeah. Like you're you're driving it wrong. You're well, fine. Don't wrong. worry about it. Let's let let's not have you come in after all. You're going to be okay on your road trip. You know, the, this is stuff like as you mentioned, Patrick. Uh, the you know my gas mileage on my my SUV um, is you know eh, I feel like it's. It's uh, it's what Volvo would hope that I would get. I don't ever expect it. I'm not taking I, it into the shop if I don't get, you know, the like 27, you know, uh, 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 miles per gallon type thing that I'm uh, uh, assumed that I will get on the freeway type thing, and much worse on surface streets. But uh, but yeah, there. I think. Tesla is probably under a lot more scrutiny than uh, any traditional legacy company would be. That's that's fair. Uh, that said, there does seem to be something more going on here. I mean, how uh, everyone in this conversation, I, I, Rob, I, I presume you drive a car on a regular basis. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you know, um, I just double checking because every so often I run into somebody who actually has functional public transit or lives on their bicycle. But how many of us have actually gotten the gas mileage we were promised by the sticker um, on the side? You of know, vehicle? when I had a Honda Civic, it was pretty solid. Yeah. I'll tell you that much. Um, I had a Toyota so, you Corolla. Know, it's, it's, but... it's only my own fault that I didn't stick with that. 
Uh, no, I laugh because I had a Toyota Corolla that would get like 30 miles a gallon on the highway and 30 miles to the gallon standing in traffic on the, the west side highway. Um, I don't know how that worked. <laughs> the physics doesn't make sense, but the, the mileage was so close I couldn't tell the difference. I would be curious if any of the major auto, the, the other major auto manufacturers actually have groups that operate like this. I also feel like this is really disappointing as a Tesla owner because if you are expecting 350 miles, but it's winter and you maybe have a lead foot and you're driving fast and thus minimizing your potential range. You know, if, if this is a worse situation than people run into with gasoline engines, or if this is, you know, eh, nothing to worry about. Sure. Well, and you're also, you know, even, you know, even a stock Tesla model of any model, you know, in the lineup is not a cheap car. You know, so you might be thinking you're, you know, paying up front for something that's going to save you money later. So, uh, well, uh, something that will save all of us is if Molly Wood comes on the show more often. Uh, we all love Molly. Uh, thanks to everybody who became patrons. We did a push over the last month. Uh, we increased a lot of pledges on Patreon. Really thank you because of your support. We are bringing Molly on the show one Friday every other month, starting in August. Uh, so just, yeah, just a gosh, August is next week. How's that possible? But to reach our goal of having Molly one Friday every month, we do st still need more help and we need your help. So if you haven't already, consider supporting the show, visiting patreon.com slash DTNS. If you already do support the show, thank you so much. Maybe you know somebody uh, who's on the fence uh, or maybe you've been on the fence. Uh, I'd appreciate, appreciate it either way. And thank you in advance. Data security and privacy is something that Calax or the Calax Institute takes very seriously. The New York based nonprofit organization was founded in 2010 by Nicholas Merrill, Micah Anderson, and Kobe Snitz with a goal of making privacy and digital security more accessible. Patrick, you're a fan of this institute. Can you explain what they're doing and how the public can benefit? Why, yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> um, so Calyx is, uh, sorry, um, a little too much Phineas and Ferb in my life lately. Uh, Calyx is all about online privacy and security. Um, their focus is kind of on privacy by design, not privacy through a desperate struggle and battle with everything you touch at your ISP and the internet. Um, the Calyx uh, ISP, for example, is run by a nonprofit called the Calyx Institute. Um, you know, they have some for-profit subsidiaries that worked around that to kind of help power the Institute. Um, Merrill, uh, Nicholas Merrill, uh, he was the first executive in an ISP, and it was in a very small ISP, to fight against the Patriot Act's expanded police powers. And he won his case. Um, and it's kind of crazy when you when you look at the history of the Calyx Institute. Um, I think he founded the Calyx Institute in 2010. He had just been ungagged from national security letter he got from the FBI in 2004. They were like, give us this information. And he's like, no. And they're like, you have to give us this information and you can't tell anybody we sent you this letter. And, and uh, it was the first constitutional challenge that was filed against the USA Patriot Act. And his experience and struggle and epic legal battle on that uh, led him to come up with the idea of the Calix Institute. Um, you know, and I also I, I will say I'm a, a big fan of Cory Doctorow, and I love how he puts it. One, I have found a secret tunnel that runs underneath the phone companies and emerges in paradise. And he calls Calix a famous, heroic, radical ISP that has been involved in groundbreaking litigation. Um, it's a 501, you know, C3 nonprofit. They do research, mm. uh, and their goal is, you know, they the three things, the, the three kind of core things people can can get from them uh, outside of you know more education on privacy and security is they do Calyx internet um, which is they have a, a relationship with T-Mobile it's unlimited mobile internet and they do everything they can to ensure your privacy on that uh, and it's legitimately unlimited and if you've ever been a full-time kind of traveling you know if you're living your van life if you're a full-time RVer actual unlimited internet is really unusual. This isn't like 30 gigs and you get dial-up speed. This is actual unlimited 24-7, 365, you know, unless they're throttling you a bit. Uh, and they charge like $750, $500, $750 a year for that. 
Um, I'm actually kind of moving from T-Mobile to that because of some hardware issues I'm having with T-Mobile. They also have now have the Calyx OS, and it's an Android mobile OS that, quote, puts privacy and security into the hands of everyday users. Uh, they do proactive security recommendations. They do automatic updates. And the idea is that, you know, you have a Google Pixel phone. You can download and get the operating system for free, or you can become a Calyx Institute member, and your reward for that is going to be a phone preloaded with the Calyx OS, which eliminates a lot of the stuff that so many carriers do where they're just, we'll just take a little of your information because we can resell it and make more money. So I think, you know, a lot of people uh, listening to uh, what you've laid out, Patrick, say, well, that sounds great. I mean, I care about privacy. I run a VPN on my internet service now. Does Calyx do anything different than that? Well, they actually also have their own free VPN service. Uh, K A L Y X dot net. Uh, that's based on the uh, Leap open source project, and I th they've they've talked about actually doing a privacy centric uh, email service too on that one. But they're an interesting company, not or I should say, you know, group or foundation. I don't know if a lot of people know about it. Uh, I was also kind of fascinated. I didn't realize that uh, Jack Dorsey's uh, Start Small had. Uh, made a significant donation to them, uh, along with the Tor Project, the Signal Technology Foundation, and the Graphene OS. Um, and I, I had actually somehow missed Dorsey's Twitter thread where he started to start small uh, back in the pandemic. But it's like, it's as fascinating as he's basically giving away like a billion and a half dollars. And I'm all for anyone supporting privacy uh, uh, projects like, you know, and obviously Signal, I'm a huge fan. Tor is amazing. And it was cool to see uh, Graphene OS and Calyx on that list. But essentially, uh, C-A-L-Y-X dot net uh, is the location for the free VPN. And CalyxInstitute.org is the primary web page for that if you want to learn more about what they offer or more about helping to secure yourself while you're out on the internet. I don't know, Rob. You sold? You have <laughs> your internet now? Feel private enough? Uh, I mean, Calyx, you know, it, 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 it sounds they're, good. They're, they're, it sounds, it, it all sounds pretty good. True Unlimited is kind of awesome. True Unlimited for mobile is incredibly awesome. I mean, the last the last time I had True Unlimited mobile, it was capped at five megabits per second. It was through AT and T, and it was approximately thirty three hundred fifty dollars a year on seven hundred dollars of two generations behind hardware. This is much better. I will say, if if you're living La Vida, you know, uh, fiber, you are not going to want to go from fiber to one of these modems unless you are profoundly profoundly invested in 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 privacy uh over speed on your internet you know they're fast like i'm not saying that t-mobile service isn't fast i'm just saying for most people if you just want all of the speed uh fiber or or uh some of the other local options maybe a good cable modem may be uh, better for your gaming performance or things like that. Although I will say the the I'm actually kind of amazed at how low the ping rates and how high the speed gets with a lot of the 5G services out there. Mm. And you mentioned the for the Calyx Internet 500 to 750 your first mm -hmm. year including hardware. Does that mean so that it's less afterwards yeah well what they do is when you get an internet membership in the calyx institute uh your perk is that you get a a mobile and a subscription so they have different levels there's like 4g with a franklin t10 hotspot right. there's 4g 5g with a quanta 5g hotspot and there's uh what they call you know that's the contributor and the contributor plus the sustainer is a MiFi x pro 5g which is a pretty impressive hotspot if you're buying a hotspot and they offer that one it's a good choice um, that's 4G, 5G, top of the line performance. That's the one that costs $750 in the first year, and then it's $500 uh, every year after that. And, you know, I have a kind of a sweetheart deal on my current T Mobile plan based on my old Sprint plan. I get 200 gigs a month for 60 bucks. So this is unlimited for a similar price after the first year. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I probably should do the math on that one. <laughs> 500 divided by 12 equals $41 a month. And, uh, yeah, my unlimited on Verizon is uh, 
you know, something like 80 bucks, which was great, but I never really know what the throttling issue is. Um, it's never really impacted me all that much, but they also tend to creep the, you know, my last bill was like 95 and I looked at it itemized and I was like, what, where's the other 10 though? I don't know. Yeah. I, you're just kind of doing that whole thing because I probably am outside the initial contract that I signed with you. So now you're just going to nickel and dine me. So <laughs> there you go. Um, well, we are never nickel and dimed by you, Patrick Norton. Um, thank you so much thank for you. being with us on the show today. Let folks know what you've been up to lately. I am still on uh, Twitter at Patrick Norton. If you have a preferred Mastodon or other alternative system, feel free to uh, kick me a tweet about that while Twitter is still up and running and, and being itself. And uh, of course, I do AVXL, the podcast with Robert Heron, where we talk about home theater and audio. And you're always welcome to go search for AVXL on your favorite podcatcher. Beautiful. Well, we're so glad to have you on the show today. And just a reminder, patrons, uh, stick around. We have an extended show. Good day, Internet. The conversation does not end here. We'll be talking about child proofing the Internet. What could possibly go wrong? Probably pretty easy to do, right? Uh, but just a reminder, you can catch this show. DTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Lynn Peralta drawing some tech stories. Can't wait to see you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>